Okay, so, well, let me, let me first uh, pose my question to you, uh, Yosef. Uh, you were talking about the tension between uh, separation and accommodation, and the uh, US system sticks to the principle of separation. So separation is uh, a reflection of the principle of uh, freedom from religion. So how can you explain the case of the wedding cake? The wedding cake? Yes. Uh, well, in which... Uh, Go ahead, explain it. <laughs> <laughs> in which a public um, store um, was entitled not to make uh, a cake uh, for the wedding of a, of a gay couple? So, first of all, I'm not an expert in American constitutional law. I study it as a comparativist, but it's not my field ex expertise. Ask me about European law, I will feel on safer grounds. Secondly, it's a very convoluted decision, and if you read the commentary on the decision, it's like us Jews, the three commentators have four ideas and five theses. So it lends itself to different interpretations. One interpretation is that it's in the private area. This, it was a private uh, company. Rendering services to, to the public. Re yes, but it's still a difference if it's a public official, an official of the state funded by public money, etc. After all, it's also allowed under the American constitutional order to have a private club which says no admission to Jews, blacks, and dogs. That's still allowed, as long as they don't get any... Okay, I, I bow to superior knowledge. But, but that's one difference. Secondly, if you read the facts, there was something about the facts and the proof that was given, etc., which allowed the Supreme Court that wanted to come to that result to say, in this case, on these facts, because of the way the prosecution was brought and because of the way they were uh, approached by officials of the state, etc., we're going to allow them to do it. But I think the majority of the doctrine says it, has, it is, does not stand of a proposition that any provider of services to the public can openly and egregiously discriminate on grounds of homosexual marriage. And finally, because we've, American constitutional law has already moved in that direction, and the situation of homosexual marriage is now def uh, protected by the Constitution. So the more interesting case is from Northern Ireland where there's a, a similar thing, and it has not yet found its way to the highest jurisdiction of Europe, I believe. Andres, is that correct? No, it, no case. No case. So we will have to see how the Europeans deal with it, because in Europe they still have not consecrated the principle of homosexual marriage. It's still on the cusp. That's the best I can answer. But I'll tell you another example which in Israel I find very, very difficult. So, Hadarat Nashim. When, when people say we want a beach that will respect the religious sensibility that men and women should not bathe together, etc. Do we say we tackle that as a principle of accommodation and say there are plenty of beaches where men and women can bathe together if they want to, why should we not accommodate the sensibility of a religious community which says, if you don't allow us that kind of beach and all beaches are public, then basically you're saying that we cannot go and enjoy the sea. So that's an accommodation approach. And the other approach says the state should not give its imprimatur to a gender discrimination which is inherent in that religious belief and by allowing that kind of accommodation, they are basically endorsing something that in our society should not be endorsed, that kind of discrimination, structural discrimination, not even pretending to be separate but equal, uh, which exists. Maybe Professor Mautner tomorrow might be talking about this when he gives his lecture. Probably, right, many? Yes, so I will leave that. But that's something to reflect where you see how this 
tension between separation and accommodation is difficult. Israel is not a good example. Uh, we, ha we have an inherent uh, discriminatory rules uh, under the personal law, the religious personal law. You said it, and I'm glad you did. <laughs> oh, I'm the chair. Maybe, Neely, you can come and sit here and chair the discussion. Well, I'll give the mic. And then Shlomo, and then Dan. As someone who follows these cases uh, pretty closely, in the U.S., I'll just maybe uh, clarify a bit. So while it's certainly true that uh, the Supreme Court has uh, validated same-sex marriage and that's not going to change, the whole fight has now moved to the public-private sector. So we've got cases coming, not only the baker who wouldn't bake, but the photographer who won't take pictures, the florist who won't arrange flowers, the this and that, the other thing. Those cases are being... Uh, um, solicited and teed up by the religious right to push them to the Supreme Court. You're quite right, in the Baker case, the court managed to slice off something and that didn't, it didn't resolve the issue. So, so that's good. The, the, but the really tough cases you didn't mention are the ones that would um, actually impose third party harm. Well, the, the Baker case is kind of like that, but the Trump administration, has issued rules uh, that allow um, employers who claim that they have religious objections to birth control to opt out of the general public policy that requires employers as part of the employee health plan to cover birth control. And they say, uh, you know, if, if, if I, cover birth control, that will make me complicit in my employee's sin of using contraception. It's hard to see how that's a difference from, I give them a paycheck. I'm complicit in the sin if they use part of their paycheck to buy birth control products. But um, the court, the Supreme Court has found itself unable to deal with this. It'll have to deal with it. Right. So. In Europe, not in the system of the European Convention of Human Rights, but in the European Union, there's a recent case which presents the problem from the other direction. So a Belgium, a Belgium employee, uh, this is the facts behind the facts. Uh, there's a strong uh, anti-Muslim sentiment in Belgium. And this employee, it's a service providing company, he, he introduces a principle of neutrality in the workplace. And one of the employees, exemplary, no problems about her performance, is a Muslim woman who is wearing a hijab. It could be also in Antwerp, a Jewish woman wearing a shaitel or wearing a, a head cover after she's married. And they say, you're not allowed to display, nobody is allowed to manifest uh, externally their religion uh, in, the, in, in our uh, place of employment and uh, therefore you have to remove the hijab. And she says, uh, I'm not manifesting my religion, I'm practicing my religions, I'm required to wear a hijab. And they say tough luck and they fire her. It gets the, to the European Court of Justice and they allow her to be fired because she refuses to remove her hijab. And then they say something that I found even more troubling because the European Court of Human Rights took a different view on this. British Airways said you're not allowed to display a woman was carrying a little cross around her neck and they said you're not allowed to do that. And the European Court on Human Rights said it's the right to manifest your religion is a fundamental human right. No right is absolute, but if you cannot show a compelling reason why it interferes with your professionalism, etc., and she is allowed to do that. And they mention, they say, there's no harm in a Muslim woman with a hijab, or etc. What I found troubling, applying the principle of proportionality, the European Court of Justice, that's the highest court of the European Union, says the only restriction they have to check before firing her, if they could find a job for her in a back in a back office where she would not come into contact with clients of the company. Think how we would feel 
if clients said, I don't want to be served by a Jew, I don't want to be served by a black person, I don't want to be served by a woman, and the court would say, you can fire them on that ground unless you can find a job where they don't come into contact with clients. So it's a little bit the, the florist, etc. but from the other point of view. Tough, it's a really problematic decision in my eye. And if you're asking me for a silver bullet how to resolve it, I told you I'm just going to show you that it's even more complex than one might have thought at the beginning. And we will wait for enlightenment from the panel tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. <clears throat> this is really a comment and a question to Uzi Rabi. Um, if one looks at uh, liberal existing liberal democracies, liberal democracies historically developed only in Westphalian states, where the idea that uh, you owe allegiance primarily to the state, and within your allegiance to the state, you accommodate your secondary allegiance to tribe, religion, the family, region, etc. Now, it seems to me that one of the problems with the difficulties which you suggested of developing liberal democracy in the Arab world is the fact, not only that some of the countries were imposed artificially by Western imperialists, but also that uh, there is no acceptance of the Westphalian idea of the primary allegiance to the state. And we saw it, uh, and you test it, of course, when there's a crisis. We saw it in, Sy in Syria, we saw it in Sudan, we saw it in Iraq. That when the body politic is under pressure, the primary allegiance of most, not all, but most citizens is to the tribe, to the religion, to the sect, and to the group. Now, if you do not have an idea of a Westphalian state allegiance, it is very, very difficult to move from there to democracy because democracy accepts that your primary allegiance is to the state and to the democratically elected government of the body politic. So perhaps many Arab countries are, are experiencing really a previous problem, not a problem of democratization, but the problem of developing a Western model of uh, Westphalian states, which insofar as they exist in the Arab world, were also imposed by the West and were considered to be by many Arab, by many Islamists on one hand and left-wing people on the other hand as Western imperialist positions. Well, uh, thank you, Shlomo, for this uh, comment and question. And I think that, um, yeah, First of all, I, I, I basically agree with you. Of course, this is what I try to, um, you know, I, I hope not to be held too essentialist, especially in this court. But, you know, in my opinion, religion in that part of the world called the Middle East is much more instrumental than any other, other I would say, part of the world. This is my take. Why we can have a symposia about that? But this is for a, for a fact. Now, the thing is that while getting into the Middle East, one should bear in mind the simple fact that the state here is not only artificial creature. It is basically, or more often than not, an anathema to religion. So, I mean, if I would take Egypt, for example, and take the incumbent, it's uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. He deposed uh, Mohammed Morsi before. So what would be the bone of contention between Morsi and Sisi? It almost sounds actually similar. So, I mean, the bone of contention is simple as that. To what extent religion should be instrumental in forging the future state or the vision of the state. This is a never-ending story here. I mean, by the way, Israel is suffering from that too. 
I think it's a very Middle Eastern thing. I'm, 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 I, I'm not sure that we can definitely tie it up to culture or history necessarily, but I am pretty sure that uh, when it comes to that, many of the things that are taken for granted while using the Westphalian, as you say, uh, paradigm or whatever, must be adjusted to the local sociocultural vocabulary. So I, I agree with you. I think that a democracy could be actually, uh, I mean, I don't know, I mean, decades or whatever, but if at all, it would be sort of a unique mix not to be found elsewhere. And, and, and it would be named in a different way, basically, because it corresponds with those attributes that we talked about. So basically, I'm, I'm with you on that, but, uh, you know, I mean, um, it is just the beginning. We have uh, uh, just one decade after the Arab Spring. You know, from time to time, actually, I tend to remind myself that after the downfall of the Bastille, there was this Jacobin terrorism there. I mean, it would take time, maybe. Um, but I am pretty sure that in the end of the day, the end game must be something of, as I said before, unique mix that cannot be found elsewhere. It would be sort of a different thing. Democracy is not good, actually, to be mentioned in the Middle East because if your erstwhile rival is the West and he takes proud of his democracy, democracy in the first place could be interpreted as kind of a Trojan horse which is going actually to be brought in. So I think that different vocabulary, vocabulary is, is, is really of high value. Hey, just a comment on uh, religion and, um, and democracy. Uh, one element, uh, notably regarding the Jewish religion and the problems we have here in Israel, is the identity or the argument about identity between the Jewish religion and the nation, and that is the Jewish nation. And many, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, many uh, religious ideas or symbols were actually regarded or also as a national symbols. For example, uh, you mentioned the Saturday, during the British mandate, Tel Aviv, which is clearly a secular town, actually tried to enforce uh, the closure of shops on Saturday, and it went to the Supreme Court, which was against it during the mandate day, and the Jewish people actually rebelled against it because they regarded Saturday in those days as a national symbol rather than a religion, a religious symbol or just being the same. And one reason that there is a certain a minor similarity between the Jewish position and that of England. The Anglican um, church is a national church. And therefore, when they have the cross on the flag, this is not only a religious, it is a national uh, symbol. And we don't have a, a, an issue here about uh, uh, nation, nationalism and uh, democracy. But in fact, this is behind the whole issue as I see it, including also uh, civil marriage. The basic reason, unjustified, I agree, totally unjustified, but the basic reason against uh, civil marriage was that this undermines the Jewish nation. So uh, uh, this was the, uh, as I say, unjustified, but one should look at the religious issues also as national issues in some cases, and in other cases as a matter of identity. The European, the question why there is a, a different attitude, as I feel it, in Europe regarding Christian and Islamic symbols is that the uh, Christian symbol is also a symbol of identity of the Belgium, of the French, and all of a sudden they rebel against the idea that the hijab would also be a symbol of identity of a French person. Thank you.
So I want to say something on that. That problem is clearly understood in Europe. And as I said, Europe is... Europe is full of uh, states where religious symbols also have a national meaning. And as a result, they are allowed. But a line is drawn. It's allowed so long as it doesn't carry over and impinges on the fundamental rights to freedom of or freedom from religion. And that's why uh, the civil marriage would not be accepted by any constitution. The absence of civil marriage would not be accepted even if you claimed, even if you claimed with credibility, and I think the claim here even lacks credibility. But even if you claim for credibility that it was a national symbol, they would say since it denies a fundamental right to marriage, etc., unless you are coerced into a religious, it would not be allowed. And the example that Linda gave, it shouldn't be such a difficult case because it's not a true instance of accommodation. Accommodation works when both communities, the religious and the secular, can be accommodated. But when you have the imposition in a way that actually creates material harm, etc., at least it's not an example of accommodation. It's something else is going, is going on there. So the problem in Israel is not with the Star of David on the flag or not even the mezuzah on Jewish classrooms. The problem is for example, the most egregious being civil marriage and other instances of that nature. Because here, the uh, totally legitimate desire to affirm a national identity which is also rooted in religion spills over into a denial of fundamental rights. No, you explain the background. Yes. We're, on the We're on the same page, Danny. We're on the same page. Yes, uh, I want to uh, make a comment in, in the following sense. I follow what you're saying, and we have to be careful here. There were re references to the United Kingdom, official religion. Uh, United Kingdom society is one of the least religious societies around. And uh, w these debates depend on the actual forces. Uh, first of all, uh, one point, freedom from religion is not only for the secular and the atheist. In a country in which, for instance, there is a dominant religion and minority religions uh, tend to be oppressed, they can make claims of freedom from religion, the official religion, in order to practice their own religion. So it's a double-edged sword. Now, in, in the British context, religion has become totally, except perhaps for the royal family, uh, totally a, cul a cultural, as you say, part of the nation and the culture. And uh, many of the European countries where you have still the crucifix in the classroom and things like that, they try to explain these, and these are secular constitutional democracies, they try to explain these as cultural aspects of the life of the, of the country. So one of the things that one has to be careful about is uh, what is the place of religion within a society, how contested it is, and what imposition does it uh, bear on the non, either the minority religions or the non-religious. If I may make an, a little comment on the Christian, the Catholic Church uh, example, because I have much less uh, expertise than Joseph, but I've worked on this uh, a little bit. I think that the Benedict position is really Carl Schmitt's political theology. Uh, and that is, there is a always been a Catholic uh, intent to work within, in order to keep power within politics. But I don't, my reading doesn't go as far as Joseph's. I think that there is a, an equation of uh, reason and faith. The main point, Benedict, and this is very clearly stated in his uh, discussion, his dialogue with Habermas, is that the, uh, you can have faith and believe that God said X, Y, Z, or those who don't have faith will come to the same conclusion by reason. But many of these arguments just don't make any sense. The abortion argument, where, where Benedict, uh, and you didn't emphasize that because you were trying, I mean, to look at the conjunction, but I think there's a conjunction and a disjunction. The, the abortion argument is, doesn't work for Judaism, where some forms of abortion, and even, I, uh, I hope I don't make a fool of myself, I think even Islam permits certain uh, abortions. Uh, 
so it cannot, in certainly secular uh, people, uh, many secular people believe that the right to abortion is a fundamental uh, right of equality of women. Uh, so the idea that you could have a universal justification of the Catholic Church's very restricted, if not absolute, position in abortion just doesn't make sense. But there's a whole series of them. So his arguments uh, fail at the level of, a, if once you get to examples uh, in terms of, is this really a universal uh, natural law position absent uh, the Catholic faith? So although there's always an intent, uh, attempt to encompass more, and that's the Schmittian side, there's also a, a, a religious dogma side that just doesn't jive. It's true. Yeah. Um, thank you. I want to follow on with what uh, Michelle just said um, about the lack of universalism in, in, in religion. And to go back to an earlier point made by Yosef Weiler about, um, you know, you don't have freedom from socialism and freedom from, uh, freedom from socialism and freedom from neoliberalism. And to, to say that religion, I think, poses a different kind of challenge to human rights from either socialism or neoliberalism. Um, I think that uh, there is a rejection in religion of universal uh, human rights uh, in the sense that religions regard themselves as chosen in some way. Um, I, to the ultimate authority of democracy, they do not accept uh, a democratic decision which is in opposition to basic do religious dogma. And what is empirically in evidence today is that they don't accept the idea of equality. Equality in the sense of the non-distinction principle of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and of all the human rights treaties is not a part of any of the religious dogma. And this is particularly, particularly true as regards women and LGTBI. And that's true of all the religions. Um, and in fact, they are very successful. Um, there are, in fact, only 28 countries in the world which allow same-sex marriage. There are 39 countries in the world which will not allow women to have an abortion um, except if their life is in immediate danger. And some countries which will not allow women to have an abortion even if their life is in immediate danger. And that includes little girls of 11 who've been raped, incidentally. So um, we, we have a, a, there is a real problem. There's a confrontation that is really um, special to uh, religious freedom. Uh, a number of international experts in the UN fight for the idea that religious freedom doesn't justify discrimination. But there is a growing group of opinion amongst the states in the Human Rights Council and in the General Assembly which does not accept that. There is a growing backlash against women's equality based on religious dogma and on states which are theocratic, um, or include actually, and Russia, which you might not call a theocracy, but which has adopted a very strongly pro-Russian orthodox approach. And the Vatican goes along with these things. So um, I think that there is a real, there is a real challenge to universal human rights stemming from religious dogma, all the, all the religions and, um, and, social, and I want to just point out one other thing. I do think that both socialism and neoliberalism can threaten human rights um, and challenge human rights in a sense. Uh, they are, however, subject to human rights. The thing is that they usually challenge um, social and economic rights rather than the, the right to equality, for example, um, on the basis of gender and, and etc. So the, the, there aren't the same obvious confrontations between universal human rights and socialism and neoliberalism. And also they are more subject to change through democratic choice. Not adequately, I think neoliberalism has overtaken um, democratic choice in empirical terms, but at least in theory, they're subject to uh, democratic decision. And religion is outside that. They do not, the religions do not acknowledge the democratic voice. I okay. suggest now that we collect, we have uh, four more uh, questions or remarks. So, uh, one, two, Moshe, Moshe, Scott, and 25. Okay, so.
Professor Rabi, can you please explain to us, to us why the Arab Spring success was very successful in Arab republics like uh, Libya, say, Tunisia, Algeria, and other places, and not in the royal uh, countries like Morocco, uh, Saudi, and, uh, and uh, I don't remember, so Jordan. Related to the previous question, I would like to make a comment. If you would place yourself in 1970, and you would have asked what are the chances... 70? 70, 70, 1970. You would have asked the chances that Spain becomes a democracy in a matter of 10 years, you would have no chance whatsoever. With such a strong uh, uh, influence of the Catholic Church and of an army, uh, characteristics that we have in, it, in, in Egypt, with a very strong unified army, and with the influence of religion on the ways of acting of people. Uh, the same goes for Morocco. So it is a fact, and you are right, that the Arab Spring, both in Morocco because it didn't take place, and in Egypt because it took place, it didn't work, it didn't lead to a transition to democracy. But I think it is very dangerous to postulate that this is a matter of culture and that this is a matter of Islam being different, say, than Catholic Church, etc. I mean, the fundamentalism of the Catholic Church in Spain was there and of the army was there and we have found it in Morocco, and we can find it in Egypt. And maybe it was a matter of touch and go, or maybe it was a matter of level of education of what we call the masses, which facilitated the transition in Spain, a consensus, whatever, which doesn't exist. But I don't like your explanation that seems to make a lot of accent on the cultural uh, Islamic uh, dif difference. It's, 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 uh, okay. it's related to the previous uh, panel. And actually this is related to Professor Dotan's uh, comments and there are many, many constitutional experts about Israel here. The argument that was made, which I, which I hear in, in different spheres, is that the over-activism over of the court, let's say, in the administrative cases, gave a good case in some ways for, for a counter-populist argument, uh, etc. But from all my conversations, my, my serious conversations with the, the thinkers of, of this concern, the issue, the front was on different places. There were four of them. One is the Katsirka Adan decision. Um, the other one had to do with uh, um, family unifications of, of Palestinian West Bankers with Israeli Arabs. The third one had to do with uh, the courts that particularly angered the Haredi uh, group. Uh, the court's decision of removing the financial aspects of the marriage agreement and divorce agreement from the rabbinic courts. And then the, the, case, the case that has kind of appeared again and again with the uh, treatment of the Sudanese, refu uh, the African refugees, uh, uh, the courts kind of repealing again and again the Knesset's orders. I think, I think this is more complex set of issues than, than I think, I think there's much point to, to the issues you raise, I mean, the critics you raise, but I, I'm not sure these are the fault lines, the serious fault lines that, that created the counter, uh, the counter conversation. And this series, uh, ah, the fifth one is actually the, the courts, again and again, decisions of, of constraining confiscation of, uh, of private land, privately owned land of Palestinians, uh, in the West Bank. I mean, all those issues are, are uh, it's, um, I'm not sure what, what should be a reasonable policy of a court when you confront um, serious issues of, 
of, uh, of state and, and human rights on those levels, right? And when you talk to the people who initiated the, the kind of the ideologues that initiated the, the counter voice, this is where the, this is the, the fault lines. These are the fault lines. And here, uh, and here I would say uh, we get to far more complex uh, question vis-a-vis vis uh, vis the role of the court and, 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 and the relationship between human rights, equality, and, and, and the state. I mean, just, just, just to mention, to, to give a more maybe complex question of, of these issues. I mean, especially if that's, I, I know from, from close connections what anger the Haredi community vis-a-vis -vis the court had to do with, with uh, constraining or imposing, you might say, the possibility of equality in, in property agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So, it gives some, some I understand the uh, sort of your critique on, on these lines, but I just want to pose where I think the fault line is or was in, in many of those frictions. So now it's up, and then, and then you have a break, and then you have a break. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, to Professor Weiler, uh, in the United States, in abortion, there are some laws who oblige the physician to warn the woman from abortion. So it's not only, I would say, from a religious point of view, or the religious point of view penetrates into the secular law. So, uh, and the Supreme Court, I think they uphold this instruction that you, you may, you have to, the doctor has to warn the woman that it might be, he is alive, it might be murder, and uh, it has a negative psychological impact on the woman. So they have to do it. That's, it's, I'm only adding something to show you. To, in my view, the, the Pope who said about uh, reason, it's a very apologetic uh, uh, comment. I'm not sure that it's true that the Catholic Church really leaves the divine natural law order and uh, says everything is reason. And because uh, it's true that some identify natural law with reason, okay, Aquinas, etc. I would like to, if I permission, I have a great discussion with Dotan. I disagree that you can point out a factor, and I, I think uh, Albert Al already mentioned it. I would like, with your permission, to read something from the Bible to show you it's my, what is, in my view, the answer to what is happening. In the course of time, I'm quoting from Samuel II, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men and ran ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. The city gate was the place of the court. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge into the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that they receive justice. And whenever anyone approached him to bow with, down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, to, take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice and so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel.
suggest that your responses will be delayed to the latest day. So, um, so Mr. Vidal, please. Uh, in, in regards to funding, or rather non-funding, of uh, religious in institutions, uh, services, such as uh, building st religious structures, uh, what is, uh, how is, what is the differentiation between uh, religious structures, you know, versus uh, theaters or uh, sports venues? I mean, if, if it's ever contested in courts? Uh, 